Oh, hey, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't see you there. Welcome back to the program today. We've got somebody, holy cow, we're going to be talking about how to stay healthy and try to avoid all the misinformation and everything that's flying around about nutrition and health. Today, we got Dr. Gilles Carvalho, MD, PhD. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Well, it's it's nice to have you on. Obviously, you've got a YouTube channel called Nutrition Made Simple. People can go over there and check out uh, a non-bias. He's not paid by anybody. He's not, you know, being pumped up by the 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 seed oil company or the the meat company. He's he's legit. He's doing his thing. He's trying to spread the information about uh, uh, nutrition. So let me ask you this: How bad is uh, the the misinformation around nutrition? Misinformation is such a loaded term that it's, I think it's almost lost all meaning because it's, it's gotten to the point where people just call each other misinformation all the time. And what used to be called misinformation, those people took the term and now call everybody else misinformation. So it just became almost a, a term with no meaning. But I would say that erroneous information, information that is not evidence-based, information that is not, does not reflect the scientific evidence or is just based on storytelling, but sometimes in the opposite direction of the science, that's extremely common. I would almost say it's the norm on social media. The majority of the content on nutrition and kind of wellness in general is the non-evidence-based, almost uh, reflexively contrarian. So taking what's known scientifically and kind of flipping it on its head and propagating that is is closer to, to being the norm than, than anything else. And there's good reasons for that, both kind of algorithm re, algorithmic reasons, human, reason, human uh, nature reasons. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it just spreads better, spreads faster. It's more, it's stickier. But people, people like to hear uh, good news about their bad habits, right? They want to, they follow whatever might be the thing that suits them best. Like, that's a big part of it. Uh, oversimplifying is a big part of it because simple messages spread much faster. That's just the reality. Yeah. And science sometimes is complicated. Sometimes, almost always, is nuanced. Hmm. And there's qualifiers and there's individual variability and all these things don't play well on social media content. Yeah. And so the more the more nuance and the more qualifiers you you try to use, the more you lose the connection to the viewer, right? And the, the simpler and the more um, monotone your your the the more like uh, one thing like this thing is poison. <laughs> this thing is is a superfood. You have to have it every day. The, the, just the more the more categorical your message is, the simpler it is to remember. Well, because you can't fit an entire nuanced sort of look at uh, something in a headline, and which is we're all sort of thriving and, and eating up all these headlines. Like I read the other day, it's like uh, espresso can save your life and it's good for you and it can make your you know make you more sexually potent or whatever. But uh, you look into it and there's it's funded by the Italian Coffee Association. How often do you see conflicts of interest with nutrition studies when you dig through them? You do see it, although. I'm a little skeptical of, of judging science based on conflict of interest because the reality is you, I mean, when you when you look at studies on the daily, some studies that are excellent are industry funded. Some studies that are terrible are independently funded. Hmm. There might be a, a, a trend. I'm not saying there isn't a trend. There are studies looking at industry funded research and they do find that there's a higher percentage of those studies that find the conclusions are favorable to the funder. So I'm not saying that trend isn't there, but when you're going through the studies one by one and you're trying to make sense of things, yeah, it's not really doable to just look at the funding and go, oh, discard this one. Sure. And the thing is you can come up with uh, a conspiracy type idea for every study <laughs> ever conducted. Every study you can you can hypothesize that it's being funded by the competitors. Sure. Right. So Isn't that, that's inherent with people who love to study nutrition. Is like you just become a paranoid schizophrenic because you're pretty sure I don't trust this. I you know, and you have to dig very very deep in order to get close to the truth. Yeah, you have to look at the the way the study is actually carried out. So the methodology, 
And then what you really look at is the currency of science is reproducibility. So an isolated study is never the end of a field. It never nails a question. It's they can, Individual studies can be seminal, but really you're looking at a field. You're looking at the pattern of research over years, and you're looking for a pattern of re reproducibility. So you're looking for different lines of evidence converging in the same direction. Yeah. That's how confidence goes up. It's not really because people have this idea that if you find one study that's perfect, then it answers one question. Um, and this is where the immediate headlines kind of come in. They, this idea that, oh, new study shows that everything you thought you knew was garbage. Uh, this is rarely the case in science. It's almost never the case. It's more like it's more like you look at a big picture, like a painting, and each dot, each pixel on the painting is one study. So you're really putting together all these pixels and trying to make sense of the big picture. So a new study is usually just another pixel. It doesn't change, you know, 50 years of research. Now, a new study, especially if you're using a new technique, can be surprising. It can create, it can show you new things. I'm not saying that that's not possible, but this reality, yeah. that this idea on, on headlines, new study inverts, you know, 50 years of knowledge. That's almost never the case. They would have to have a really new machine that could really like do something fantastic in order to make that uh, true. But at the same time, are, are, is there anything out there where you're still like maybe skeptical or in the minority where you think, I'm pretty sure this is bad for me, but all these, you know, history of studies say that it's good. I mean, smoking for a long time, there was an, an incredible amount of studies that said, oh, it's totally okay. And it wasn't until I think that built up over time where these other studies came out. Uh, it was it was building since the beginning of the 20th century. So the, the body of evidence was, was already there, but it wasn't well known to the public and even doctors. So you had, by the middle of the century, you still had lots of doctors who smoked. Actually, most doctors still smoke, but that's because there's a disconnect between, often between clinicians and the research world. Uh, but the body of evidence was already there. It was only in the 60s that it really became, with the Surgeon General's report, there was like a historic Surgeon General's report, I think it was in the late 60s, hmm. that really put everything together. And by then it's hundreds, if not thousands of studies, but those had accumulated as always over years and years. Um, that, means so just, that, that means we don't put into practice the things that we know about science politically, like we don't, we, we know, obviously you're saying we knew about it, but we just chose not to tell people or whatever. Part of it is that, well, scientists in general, and I, I take responsibility for this, scientists in general are not good at communicating with the public. They also don't have direct channels of communication with the public. It's changing now with, with social media, but still there's this, this, this barrier. Uh, scientific training almost trains you to do the opposite of talking to the public, trains you to speak in these arcane terms and very technical terminology, talk to, an, to other specialists. Even across fields of science, we use so much technical uh, jargon that you can, you know, if I listen to another scientist in a, in a field that's not mine, I might not even understand what they're saying. I, I got to look up the terminology to then understand. The principles are, are very similar. But the terminology and the, the, feed, the studies that you refer to are so specific. Um, so basically, scientists are trained to do everything that is the opposite of kind of what a, what a good communicator does. So to talk without emotion, um, to be very technical, very precise, to qualify everything, all these things kind of get in the way of um, communicating with the public in general. And so... Yeah, there's a barrier, a big barrier between what is known scientifically and then what the public has access to. In fact, that's one reason that I started doing these videos. I, I felt that maybe I could contribute a little bit to uh, bridging that gap. And you're doing good. I Honestly, you have a very, you know, balanced and but still scientific in a way where you, you have to explain these things. You have to somehow turn real science data into like 
anecdotes, basically, where people latch on to an emotional aspect to what you're saying and then go, okay, I get it. There's no real right answer, but it's just, a, like you said, a mosaic of different studies where we have to take the consensus and stuff like that. Why is it so hard for people to to get a hold of like, and grasp this concept that it's, there's, it's not black and white? I think it's it's against our nature, right? We want simplicity and it's complexity is just much harder to grasp in general. Mm. Um, I think people do grasp it. It's not, I mean, once I, I have a number of videos where I go over this and viewers grasp it right away. So it's not a, a hard concept, but it's just um, simplicity is much easier to communicate and much easier to accept. It requires less effort mentally to to really encompass. And because most most uh, fit public facing content does oversimplify and does kind of bastardize science, that's what most people are exposed to primarily. Mm. So yeah. when you're trying to give a little bit more nuance, you're almost swimming against the tide. It's 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 uh, yeah, it's a lot of work. But uh, again, because it's still unusual, it's getting better, to be honest, because when I started out five years ago, there were very few scientists talking about nutrition on, on social media. There was a lot of influencers, but very little kind of evidence-based content. There was maybe one or two sources. Now it's, it's getting better. There are people, some doctors and some scientists that are popping up. Mm. So it, there starts to be like a, a core of people doing this. And that's important because I see this more and more with time. It used to be that I would make a video going over the science of a field and people would tell me, I don't know about this because all these other sources are telling me the opposite, right? And that's the whole reason that I'm making content. It's precisely because what's out there isn't really reflecting the science. Now that's starting to change with people going, yeah, these other two or three channels are telling me sort of the same thing. So I'm starting to see that this might be True. So it's creating kind of a rift between yeah. channels that do this and then channels that still do kind of the old fashioned um, based on personal preference or based on kind of stories, yeah. just going yeah, yeah, with yeah. whatever stream of consciousness. Yeah, that's the horrible part. I saw a Good Morning America segment where they were talking about diets, different diets, nutrition and stuff. And then uh, Al Roker says something, well, you just pick the studies that suit you best and you go with them, you know, the go with the flavors you like and then make sure, you know, doctor says eating three sticks of butter a day is good for you. Yeah. Um, so as far as the most egregious sort of zealots that are out there that make the most outrageous claims, you know, you've got your Dr. Sean Bakers and your, who are some of the most egregious examples that you've run into where you're like? Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with a lot of the influencers, but the way I familiarize myself with some of them is through audience requests. So okay. occasionally, occasionally we'll do a video where we take a look at an influencer and over the, the five years, we've done maybe half a dozen of those. Um, and so the last one we did was Dr. Stephen Gundry, who is, yeah, okay, so you've heard of him. Yeah, so that was, um, I, actually him I had heard of and I had, had seen some things here and there, but this was a podcast that he went on, like a two hour conversation with two other doctors. So the level, the claims that he made there are just staggering um, all the way from, uh, the, some of the long-lived populations that have been recorded, um, some of these the, the blue zones. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Yeah, yeah. So basically, the, his idea is that some of the blue zones they're living longer because they smoke. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the, the thing is not it's not that suggesting that is crazy. It's that there's no evidence for it. Like there's no compelling human evidence for it. So this is what these influencers will often do: is they'll they'll look at what we call a mechanism. So something in, in vitro, for example, a lab experiment in a Petri dish or in a, te in a test tube, and they'll jump to humans. And this is a, a like a capital sin in science. So they'll look at a biochemical reaction and they'll say, ah, so therefore this food that contains that thing that causes this reaction in the lab is gonna be good slash bad for human beings. This is extremely common 
And when you do this, more often than not, you end up being wrong because the mechanisms often do not pan out in human data. So he does this all throughout the two-hour conversation. So he has that he has that um, smoking claim right from the get-go. Then later on in the interview, so the other it's kind of funny because the other two doctors that are interviewing him and are get increasingly frustrated with time. So they start out all very nice and very welcoming, and then they just kind of gradually challenge him and question him. And by the end, they're just frustrated. You can tell that they're tired, uh, and they keep trying to get him to provide evidence and he keeps going around in circles. So it's like trying to grab a fish, like a wet fish. It's not, it's not uh, the slippery bastard. Yeah. Um, I've seen them do yeah, correlate causation and correlation Whatever. it's not, you know, you can't just link one thing. There's like, Oh, the rise of plant-based diets. And there's also a rise in colorectal cancer. See vegans will kill you or whatever. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, that's another big one. It's looking at these, we call that ecological data. So these trends, right? Countries, country so-and-so, you know, has, eats more of this food and has more of that disease. So they must be causal. Um, that is so, so flawed, that type of logic, because there's a thousand variables. You can't do that. That all, that type of data is good to get, to have ideas to then test. It's not, you don't do this logical leap to, ah, so there's cause and effect. Yeah. But so that's another big one. Yeah. We as humans thrive on this sort of direct answer. It was like, I need, it's like fascism. We love fascism because it's like an easy answer for very complex questions. Oh yeah. Okay. I believe the guy. Um, yeah. So what about, uh, I mean, the plant-based diets, these guys also make outlandish claims. You actually were digging into Dr. Greger, who I love Dr. Greger. He's, he's at least trying to be evidence-based and stuff, but he still makes outrageous claims. Now, when it comes to the carnivores and the ketos versus the plant-based doctors, guru guys, uh, which one's more hyperbolic? I mean, I, I honestly, I don't see a big difference between between them. And my, my viewers always complain that I don't make, and usually they'll, you know, the, the, depending on their diet, they want me to say that those guys are a little bit less bad. But <laughs> here I, mean, I am, yeah. To me, the differences are cosmetic because if you are, making stuff up or showing just, you know, chunks of data based mm. on your personal preference. I mean, yeah, we could make distinctions based on oh, this diet might be more damaged than that. At the yeah. end of the day, you're doing the same thing. You're, you're, you know, misrepresenting uh, the evidence and putting all this veneer that what you're doing is, is um, communicating science when really it's not. Um, and in some ways, Gregor, so we have a video on Michael Gregor. There was, it was a debate that he had on, on TV. Um, and after that, there's been a couple of documentaries that we also reviewed where he is featured. And typically he does the same thing. Every documentary where he shows up, he does the same thing. Either exaggerates something or he'll present something and leave something out so that yeah. the, the, the bottom line is not accurate. Mm. And it's so strange because to me, it's one of the strangest cases because Basically, what he's telling people is eat more fruits and vegetables and more unprocessed plants. I mean, there's endless amounts of, of data to back that up. But then the the, te the, the the temptation to exaggerate has to say, no, because this reverses heart disease and it's the only diet ever shown to reverse heart disease. It's not That's not backed by compelling evidence. It's not a com uh, convincing case. Well, why do you have to say that? Why not just say, we have abundant evidence that eating a plant-rich diet is supportive of cardiovascular health, is good for prevention of heart disease. Why, why isn't that enough? No, it has to go the extra yeah. step of it, just exaggerating. And, um, it can extend your penis size up to a foot. Okay, that's enough. That's too much. That's, yeah, you're now, now you're exaggerating. Um, but yeah, I think he's got to play the game. But but in your eyes, okay, so obviously there was an interview recently where Dr. Bernard, who I've also uh, interviewed, and he's very against dairy and has done his own studies on dairy with the, uh, his institute or whatever. And uh, he did an interview with the Diary of a CEO people, some YouTube channel, and uh, it got taken down. And we don't know why, but I just wanted to get your take on what he claims about dairy. And what, you, what, what do you think about dairy? 
it's very heterogeneous right off the bat. Mm. It's really difficult when people ask you dairy because there's so many different foods within that category, right? All the way from butter to yogurt to cheese uh, and more. And the outcome data is different. So we, the evidence looks different in terms of health effects okay. for these different foods. Well, let's start with milk. So in general, um, the fermented dairy has better health outcomes. So especially yogurt and, che and cheese to some extent, okay. that is linked to better health outcomes. And then, so that would be on one end of the spectrum. Butter would be on the other end of the spectrum where it's generally connected to not so positive health outcomes if mm. eaten in a substantial amount, right? We're not talking about having a little bit of butter here and there. And then milk is somewhere in the middle. There's no clear, um, you know, it varies depending on the outcome, um, but milk would be somewhere in the middle. No clear benefit or harm. It depends on the situation. It's very, it it's very heterogeneous. One, one third of all dairy studies are funded by the industry. Uh, it's a little shocking. Um, but, you know, there's claims about the sugars in it and, and it's linked to insulin spikes and also the bioavailability of calcium in the milk. Is it not? Uh, there's an incredible amount of calcium in it, but it's less bioavailable than leafy greens. Is that true? Uh, it's less bioavailable than some leafy greens. So it depends if the, if the leafy greens contain oxalates or not. So, for right. example, collard greens are low oxalate and they have a lot of calcium. And, yeah, the bioavailability there is pretty good. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're getting enough uh, of these sources, it's possible to get plenty of calcium from plant sources. But it, but most people in the Western world barely eat greens, and they get a lot of calcium from from dairy. So, in order to to cut back on dairy, they would have to replace it with something else. You you want to be careful, just yeah. telling people, you know, dairy is bad for you. First of all, it's not accurate, but. But is, um, but is the going to oxalates is is the uh, threat of this overblown? Because I think you can cook out oxalates. First of all, if you're eating raw spinach, spinach has a lot of oxalates. But if you're eating like kale or cabbage or things like this, there's not as many oxalates. Is it overblown? This paranoia of oxalates. People have written whole books about it. I'm I'm trolling them on Twitter, being like, I yeah, it's hugely hugely overblown. I mean, it's there is no evidence to back up most of the claims that are made on the internet. Now, oxalates are a concern specifically for people who form kidney stones. Okay. Uh, and there are specific stones that are, that are with oxalates. So stone formers do have to be mindful. But even those, I mean, we have a whole interview with one of the, the world's leading authorities on oxaluria and oxalosis and all this stuff, a nephrologist from NYU. So he goes over all this in detail, but bottom line is he doesn't tell people to completely eliminate spinach, but he does tell people, and he works with stone formers, so it's a very specific crowd. He does tell people to go to head to moderate. Don't don't have a you know a smoothie of just raw spinach every day that might lead to issues. Mm. So there are some concerns there for that specific population. For everybody else who's not a stone former, he doesn't recommend any restriction of of those, even those high oxalate foods. Um, so I think like with everything else, there's exaggeration. A lot of these fads on the internet originate exactly like this. So you take something that is an, uh, a sensitivity or a, uh, a problem that a, a very specific group of people have, and then you blow it to everybody. <laughs> gluten. So, yeah, gluten is a good example. And the plant-based people do, do, do this too. One of the arguments, in fact, for nobody should be eating dairy is, oh, a lot of people are lactose intolerant. That's true. A lot of people are lactose intolerant, but what about those that are not? Why, yeah. why is that a reason yeah. to? I mean, by that re by that logic, nobody should eat peanuts, nobody should eat you know soy, and nobody should eat uh, eggs or dairy. Like like you you eliminate almost everything because somebody has an intolerance somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate that we, as I, I'm an animal rights guy too, so I go, but I go fishing around for the nutrition. I'm trying to get this. I show people. It's also not good for you. It's cruel, but it's also, it's really bad for you too. But it's, you know, we still need so much more concrete evidence to start the plant-based revolution. I am a plant-based zealot in that way. Um, evidence-based. Yeah, I but, think if people are making um, an ethics-based argument, 
I think that's respectable. I don't have any problem with that. Yeah. I think what's, what's weird is when they, they want to argue the ethics, but they use this sciencey sounding argument. Oh, you shouldn't eat um, meat because it's negative and it's in, in dairy. You should, everybody should stop eating dairy because it's harmful. It's not really compelling. It's like just es in this esoteric way. It's just like bad for, it gives you bad, you know, juju. It, uh, <laughs> it's not really a, an argument. And that's the problem with the people that I do run into constantly. Like I, I was a musician for many years, uh, a little too esoteric sometimes, but still got the good idea. I like organic agriculture, all that stuff. I, I do believe that uh, our food system needs to change. Like we, we were talking about before we started. Um, but um, so the, 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 the jury's not out on milk in, in, in your opinion. Okay. What about something like uh, meat, saturated fat in meat uh, and the different meats that we got? I mean, what's the consensus here? So saturated fat, in a substantial amount can raise cholesterol and ApoB, which is a, just a better marker of a cardiovascular risk than cholesterol, mm -hmm. um, and can raise cardiovascular risk. That's pretty established. Um, it's not really controversial. People are fighting it though, right? There's, uh, you see these comments. I've sure. seen you on Twitter where you're constantly battling these people. I don't even bother anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's not really controversial scientifically. I mean, if you look, if you look at, you can go over every professional health organization, every dietary guideline anywhere on earth, every country, pretty much all agree um, that it's not, it's not the saturated fat is bad. The problem is sometimes this is simplistically worded. And so it's a, it's a straw man, right? It's not that saturated fat is bad. Saturated fat is in every food, in every unprocessed food. Even spinach has some saturated fat. Um, yeah, uh -oh. all, all plants have some saturated fat in there. It's a very small amount, but it's in there. Um, but the, so the problem is, is it's always a matter of how much, right? The, the, the dose makes the poison. Um, so, and, and in fact, the more I think about this and the more I talk about this, the more I think that talking about saturated fat and unsaturated fat isn't really helpful for most people because people don't think about that when they sit down to eat. They think about foods. Hmm. What what am I going to eat? What's my meal look like? Yeah. So I think that's that's the more actionable advice is what is what does a meal look like uh, for some people thinking of a typical or traditional Mediterranean style uh, diet that helps. Yeah. Um, so you know, trying to go mostly unprocessed foods. Go easy on the ultra processed stuff. Yeah. Um, so unprocessed fruits and vegetables, legumes, whole grains, lean meats pri primarily, uh, favoring white meats, some dairy if you want. Uh, that's health wise, it's not really a problem. Fatty fish is good as well because again the balance there is more to unsaturated. Yeah. Um, so say, well, say you didn't want to do the fish. Uh, can, where do you get the? I know what is it? DHA and uh, some other types of omegas. EPA, DHA. Yeah. Do you got what's the alternative there for us that don't want to kill that poor little fishy? Uh, so basically, you have the short chain omega threes and the long chain omega threes. For some, some for the for the short chain, you can get them from plants. So you can get them from from nuts and seeds and things like that. Flax seeds and walnuts and all these things have omega threes. Then there's a whole debate whether we can convert enough because there's an elongation process. So the short chain omega-3s, the, the, the ALA gets elongated into eventually DHA and EPA. So those DHA, EPA are the long chain omega-3s that are present in fish. Hmm. They're also present, for example, in algae. In fact, that's where the fish get them from. Ah. The people who are exclusively plant-based, that's one, one source is algae. But you can't eat a lot of algae, right? You're going to get radioactive poisoning or something, right? <laughs> so you can get, you can get, depends on the, on the algae. So the, the ratio of the omega threes to contaminants varies. Um, there are some that are more dangerous, but for example, dulse is pretty concentrated. Uh, also a good source of iodine. Um, Maybe the so radioactivity helps the uptake, you know, it gives it a little boost. 
<laughs> I don't know. I don't know exactly radioactivity wise. I haven't seen too much uh, data on that, but there is a concern, for example, with contaminations of uh, heavy metals and things like that. Okay. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. They just said, well, you can eat nori uh, a lot, but you, there's a limit there where you shouldn't eat too much because you'll mm -hmm. have some issue. Yeah. Uh, there's, yeah. So there's mercury and PCBs and things like this that people. Yeah. Um, another thing that plant-based people sometimes do is they supplement with, um, long chain omega threes with algae oil. Okay. But again, that comes from algae, but those are grown typically for the supplements. They grow them in a, in an aquarium. So there's less contamination there or, or none. Yeah. Um, so some people do that. The evidence on that is not completely conclusive, but some people do it just on the off chance. Yeah. So the optimum, it sounds like from everything that I've heard you talk about is the optimum for you from your perspective is plant-based, but with a little bit of fish sometimes. Is that, I mean. I, no, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily the, I, I, say, I think a, a diet uh, with an abundance of unprocessed plant foods, absolutely. That's what the abundance, the, the, the predominance of evidence is telling us. But whether it includes fish, um, some meats, some dairy, that's more a personal choice, I yeah. don't think. Um, but as far as an optimum or more, most efficient protein, obviously beef is, uh, uh, at least nutrition-wise, uh, beef, beef versus legumes. I mean, what's, what's the consensus there? Well, the, when you talk to people who, who do the protein, uh, protein biology for a living, it's pretty generally accepted now that they can both work. They can both give you enough protein and enough of all the essential amino acids, even for to maximize mu muscle growth. Hmm. However, it does require more attention to put together a diet that doesn't have animal products. It is, it is a bit harder. And you might need to supplement if you're going for like for bodybuilders, right? For somebody maximizing um, hypertrophy. Uh, the so the the kind of the, the threshold that's suggested is 1.6 grams of protein per kilo of body weight. Okay. That's kind of where it maximizes around there is where it maximizes um, hypertrophy, muscle growth. Um, but now you have to come. You have to get the amino acid profile by mixing in a grain with the legumes. though. is that right? Like some kind of rice and you get um, carrot. You know, if you if you honestly, if you if you if you ate uh, the the beans, probably have enough of of all the, the amino acids. If you if you were getting enough calories from beans, hmm. if you look at the um, chronometer, you'd probably get enough. But the thing is, nobody eats a diet exclusively of, of black beans. Nobody. Nobody who has the resources to, to be listening to this anyway. Um, <laughs> right? people, who have, people who have a diet that's only one food, they have other problems. Their problem is not lack of nutrition information. Their problem is just poverty and yeah. uh, living in, 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 in places where it's, they have a lot of, a lot of issues. Yeah. But for the, for the vast majority of people that are asking these nutritional questions, nobody's eating a diet of one food. Um, not by necessity anyway. So well, I met I met somebody who was totally insane one time, and they told me that they only eat white foods. And I thought that sounds like the most unhealthy thing in the world, like fettuccine alfredo and marshmallows. I don't know what these people eat. <laughs> I, I hadn't even heard of that one yet. <laughs> um, because, well, there's yeah. some weird people in the world, Doc. I don't know. Yeah, he, he, yeah, uh, eggshells are great, and paper. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you're gonna, yeah, you're always going to find. Scour the internet enough, you'll, you'll find somebody to argue for almost anything. Yeah. But since everybody pretty much, to an approximation, everyone is eating a variety of foods, whether it includes some animal foods or not, is not really going to be a problem protein-wise, okay. as long as it's, it's a diet with diversity. And as long as it's a diet, if for people who do eat plant-exclusive, you do want to have some protein-rich foods in there, like, like, like legumes. Yeah, beans okay. and um, soy products and things like that. Okay, so uh, a big deal. Okay, a big. I think the one of the most uh, you know tragic and weird things about being from the United States and growing up there and seeing the evolution of food and what people eat is the sugar. The sugar has been introduced to everything 
ketchup, pickles, and it, I mean, it's all got sugar. In it. I grew up in a high school that had Pepsi machines because they had a special contract with the to poison children. Um, where are we at with this whole sugar thing? And and what's the difference between like high fructose corn syrup and regular sugar and and, and the glycemic index of all these kind of stuff? So in general, it's a, it's obviously a problem. Um, there's an excess of these refined carbohydrates in general. Sometimes it's pure sugar, sometimes it's refined carbs in different forms. They're all an issue because, and, and you know, it might all come down to just caloric intake because these things are refined. And because of the way they're put together, people end up eating more calories than they need. And so it ends, you end up storing too much fat and that it has all types of metabolic consequences. Um, so uh, it's absolutely an issue. I think it's a general issue of ultra processed foods with or without um, sugar. I mean, some the, the, the funny thing is people are uh, aware of this issue of the sugar. And so, of course, the processed food, the, the, the food industry is happy to cater. Hey, here's some junk that is sugar free. Right. And if you're wary of fat, hey, here's some junk that is fat free. Um, so at the end of the day, it's not so much the one ingredient, it's avoiding this category of foods that are these ultra processed packaged foods, because they'll, they'll supply those foods with whatever mix of ingredients you choose. Gluten free, you know, yeah. high, high protein, they, they'll put fiber in there, they'll put, they'll throw a vitamin in there. It's not a problem. Um, yeah, I remember when they th they told started telling people that it, everybody was getting fat, and they were like, "Oh no, everybody's getting fat." People started complaining. They're like, "Well, we're getting fat," and they said, "Oh well, we'll take the fat out of everything, but we'll increase the sugar by like thirty percent." Right. Um, thanks, thanks, free market. Right. And they can economics. take out the we can take out the sugar also. Um, and some of these some of these products do seem to be comparatively better. Like if somebody asks me, should I have diet coke or should I have regular coke? We have pretty compelling evidence that the diet coke is better. Really? Yeah. What, what you did a video? Wait, let's talk about uh, artificial sweeteners because I am not a fan, and apparently the consensus is against me. Um. So it depends what you mean by consensus, because the the later the la the last video we we did on this topic, I was actually disagreeing with a way in a way the consensus of the WHO, which is saying that they're fine, or no, that they, they said that they are uh, bad. They, they were kind of discouraging artificial okay. food. And you, right. yeah, that's what I say. But I'm still skeptical. So my position, based on the evidence, and I've talked to a number of people who researched this specifically. My, by the way, I don't consume artificial sweeteners. I don't go out of my way to introduce them into my diet. But the question with artificial sweeteners is, are they better than the alternative? Are they better than the regular sweeteners? Oh, wow. Because that's that's who it's made for that's i don't true. think anybody's a, right i mean it's it's either question is valid i don't but i don't think anybody's arguing that someone like you or me who isn't consuming a lot of junk food and a lot of any sweetener should be going out of their way to consume artificial sweeteners okay the argument is here is a of a, a, a product that is similar to the one you were consuming but has artificial sweeteners instead <laughs> The methadone of the whole thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so we have a lot of evidence indicating that, yes, this is better in terms of weight loss and cardiometabolic uh, markers and even outcomes than the regular sweetened products. Okay. Uh, now, might there be concerns long term with intake of a lot of artificial sweeteners? It's possible. The studies we, do. we have don't, don't go... We 30 years, so oh, really? it's entirely uh, possible. I'm, I'm entirely open to that. Um, so it really depends on what question you're asking, right? But is it, yeah. Is it, it's really difficult to get long-term studies anyway, and the only people that are really uh, can pay for long-term studies are the corporations basically that make this stuff, and aren't long-term studies incredibly rare in, in for food products? So randomized trials are usually short, and especially the, the corporations usually pay for short-term uh, trials because they want to result fast. Mm. Um, and there might be other reasons there in, in there as well. And they're also cheaper, obviously. Yeah. The long, the very long term, like decades, are almost always not going to be randomized trials. They're usually these epidemiological observational studies. So those are out there, but um, 
they have some caveats to them. Randomized trials also have caveats, but they basically are complementary because they cover for each other's weaknesses. The randomized trials tend to be smaller and shorter, and the these observational studies are longer and larger, but they have some other caveats in terms of the more variables. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So we have to take all of these, none of these studies are perfect, and we have to take all of it and kind of put it together in this mosaic that we were talking about and see what the, 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 the big picture looks like. And that's basically how we arrive at conclusions on anything in science. In, yeah. um, well, nutrition and biomedicine. Yeah, I'll remind all my listeners that uh, the news came out one third of all scientific studies that were published last year got retracted because the methodology was fraudulent or not good. So one third that does Ooh. not seem right. I, I would like to see that. Yeah, right. that's right. that's was incredibly high. It usually takes so long to get a paper retracted. And there are I know people complaining about papers that are clearly fraudulent and it takes years and years for a paper to get retracted. Yes, yeah, send me that. I'll take I, a look. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in the meantime, um, PUFAs, okay? I had a friend that quit her vegan diet because of PUFAs. And uh, can you explain a little bit what PUFAs is and is the threat of PUFAs, what's the big deal here? The oxygenated oil or whatever. What, what's going on here? Yeah, so PUFAs stands for polyunsaturated fatty acid. Uh, we were talking a little while back about saturated and unsaturated fats. These are just this refers to the chemical formula. Um, so polyunsaturated are a subcategory of unsaturated fats. And so some of the foods that we've talked about, uh, nuts and seeds, fatty fish, these are foods that have a fair amount of polyunsaturated fats. So the this concern, uh, the main concern that I hear about polyunsaturated fats is the question, the, this question of the oxidation, mm. that they're more... Uh, labile, they're more prone to being oxidated or oxidized. That's true mainly in the test tube uh, setting. Also, if you uh, expose, for example, oils to high heat for hours on end, yeah, you're going to see some oxidation there. But that's not really uh, particularly relevant to you know, eating a piece of fish or eating walnuts or dressing a salad with an oil that's more polyunsaturated or sauteing something with an unsaturated fat. That's not really where that comes in. Mm. The other side to this that's kind of interesting is lots of things are oxidating. Uh, exercise causes oxidation. Right, you can. There's studies showing oxidation following exercise, but it's the it's the the, the balance, the net effect of, food, of foods or activities that you want to look at because something can have an oxidating effect and have ten thousand positive effects. The net effect can be positive, hmm. and even the oxidation can have. There are uh, ideas about this. Minor oxidation can cause the body to go in to try to fix um, those changes and actually upregulate its defenses, its antioxidant mechanisms. Right. And this is called hormesis, where you then become actually more protected against oxidation. Now, this is kind of speculative, but the point is we don't just look at an, a biochemical or a chemical reaction in a vacuum. We have to look at the full effect in a human being. So exercise is recommended, even though it can be oxidating. Why? Because the net effect health-wise is health promoting. It's been shown over and over in study after study. Mm -hmm. Same for most of these unprocessed or lightly processed forms of unsaturated fats. Yeah. Whether it's fatty fish or nuts and seeds and, and some of these oils too, then the outcome data for these oils, for these seed oils that it's the new uh, thing <laughs> on the internet is to <laughs> gang, gang up and, and say that they're poison. Yeah. I'm open to it, but I've I've made now three or four videos where we went over it painstakingly. We went over the evidence on specific questions. Are seed oils inflammatory? Is canola oil bad or good? Yeah. The balance of evidence is overwhelming. I want to tell people if they're listening to this, go over there and see Nutrition Made Simple's video on seed oils. He did you did such a great job of of looking at the inflammation markers in each seed oil. And if you're like, 
I don't see anything. And you went, you even did government funded studies. You did um, industry studies. You did a great job of, you know. Yeah. Of, and I, I mean, I don't have a, a horse in the race. Like I said, I don't, right. I don't get funded by either side and I don't, I'm not a fan of, I mean, I'm not in, in love with DC laws. It's not like I'm defending a dietary preference, but to me, it's like these people are, are going crazy over this. Show me the evidence. Like the, yeah. the data is overwhelmingly in the opposite direction. Where is this coming from? Yeah. Well, there's some stuff I will. I know whiskey's not good for me, but I'm still going to drink it. And I have that bias. I have that ideological bias. Um, go on. Um, so, I, like, I, I like to make the distinction between the scientific claim and personal choice. Right. right? They can be completely different worlds. It's okay to say, I don't eat this because I don't want to. Yeah. You don't need to justify yourself to anyone. Yeah. But it's different from saying, hi, I'm a doctor and this food is poison for you. Yeah. That's not a, a personal opinion. That's or it it sounds like it's not. Yeah. So one thing has to be based on evidence, the other doesn't. It would be nice to just be honest about everything and just if you're something's going to kill you, at least you know it and you've, you know, you sign up for it. You say, okay, I'm okay with this. Let's, let's eat a cheeseburger. Fine. Yeah. Um, informed decision. Right? Yeah. I think it's um, fine to expose yourself to risk, but knowingly it's a perfectly fine decision, but give people the, the ability to make an informed decision. Yeah. Well, we're still not out of the, the woods yet with the, all the information that's swirling around about what's good and what's bad. I saw one the other day was uh, chewing gum makes teenagers smarter. And then I go click on the <laughs> Reuters article and I scroll to the bottom. It's like, oh, this was funded by the Wrigley Institute. I was like, I hate chewing gum. I'm a minimalist. I don't want anything extra. It's like, but how would yeah. they even... How would they even wing that? How would they even yeah. design a study to show that? I yeah. can't even... <laughs> You'll have to check it out. Do a video on it. I mean, yeah, I can't even it's, tell how you would do that. That's really bad. Um, I did want to say before I go, so I don't embarrass myself and I look stupid. Uh, I looked it up. According to IFL Science and a few um, NIH uh, sources I have here, approximately 10,000 research papers were retracted in 2023, setting a new record for the most retractions in a single year. This being a significant number of retractions uh, and it indicates a substantial portion of the scientific papers published. Um, so maybe not a third, but of course I'm a reactionary, so I like to exaggerate everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a lot of papers, but yeah, it's. Uh, I have no idea what percentage that would be. I, I imagine a relatively small percentage, maybe maybe 5%, but I'm, whatever percentage that is, it's way too many. It's 10,000 <laughs> 10, too many. 10,000 too many. You got that right. Yeah. yeah. Eh, it's so political, but uh, hopefully we'll get to the uh, bottom of it one day and people will cease being like these inflamed, sick bags of meat walking around miserable and depressed and unhealthy and stuff. I, uh, the world is a, is a constant nightmare, as you know. It's not only just that, but the politics of everything, everywhere, all at once. It's a, it's a, it's a battle. I, I'm a, I'm an inveterate optimist, and I, I try to see the, the positive in everything. Okay. Thank God I got you because I needed you today. Oh, geez. Sometimes, sometimes it takes a lot of work, but yeah. Oh my God. Um, well, you'll have to come back and cheer me up another time, um, Doctor Gio Carvalho. Wonderful human being. Nutrition made simple. Anything you want to add before we cut out? Lovely to be on, and uh, we'll we'll stay in touch. If people, yeah, if people want to get in touch, uh, Nutrition Made Simple is the YouTube channel. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, the handle is at Nutrition Made S3, and I'm looking to maybe start uh, exploring TikTok and maybe Instagram this year. the The whole social media adventure has been gradual. <laughs> you haven't. It hasn't shaken your faith in humanity at all. It's, 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 it's colored it. It's colored it. <laughs> Big sigh. Yeah. I, there, are, there are good days and bad days, but uh, mo most of the, most days are good. Well, we got to keep trying, don't we? As long as we're living and breathing. Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll sign off. We'll talk right after this. I'll sign off to everybody in TV land. Hey, thanks for coming, everybody. We'll see you next time. <laughs>